The winter. <laughs> but I'm thankful that you have all been able to come and we want to use this day to bring praise to our God. Well, let's again go to him in prayer and ask for his uh, fulfillment of his promise. Let's pray. Our great God and Father in heaven, we know that everything comes from you, even the snow that is coming down, it comes from your hand. And we bow before you and acknowledge that you are a good and a faithful creator, a God who continues to provide for all of your creatures in this world, and in particular, demonstrating your love for your people. We thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you that it's because of his work that we can come and stand before you today and know that we are accepted. Gracious God, we take this day that you have given to us and we know it's to honor you. We want to do that. We pray that you would help us. Lord, we are weak. We are sinful. We are so easily distracted. Would you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and will you enable us to worship you, to bring you the praise that you deserve? Even as we consider your truth this morning, our God, may our minds and my hearts and our hearts be aflame with your praise as we remember all that you have done for us in Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we continue in our confession of faith, I hope that you have the page, the front is justification that we just finished and the back is adoption and sanctification and that's where we're proceeding today. So if you don't have one of those, there are plenty of extra copies on the front table by the doors. So today we are proceeding to this uh, chapter number 12 on adoption. And here, of course, we're remembering all of the things that God has done to save us. Our theologians of the past have called this the order of salvation. And so they present God's saving works in terms of an order. Sometimes that order has to do with time. For instance, we know that back in eternity, God chose us, and then he sent Christ to save us, and then in our own history, he sends the Holy Spirit to apply that work. And what are all of these things that he applies to us? How does he lead us along in this work of salvation? So we come to adoption, and just several matters of introduction. We're exploring the riches of God's grace. Let's not forget that as we think about salvation. These are the riches of God's grace that he has poured into our lives. This is the salvation that he gives to his people, and so we're brought to consider this incredible blessing of adoption. We also need to remember that we're still in this legal sphere. Remember in justification, we were thinking that this isn't God doing something in our lives to change us. This is God changing our legal standing before the throne of God. So in justification, what was our legal standing before justification? We were enemies. We were condemned sinners. In justification, we were forgiven and we were accepted as righteous, a different legal standing. And so here in adoption, this legal standing continues to improve. And so here we're reminded, we're thinking about what God has bestowed on us as the objects of his eternal love. It's also helpful for us to compare the work of justification and adoption as ascending benefits that come to undeserving sinners in the heavenly courtroom. So God in justification has done incredible things for us. We were sinners, we were enemies, 
He's changed that status. We're forgiven, we're accepted as righteous. And now the benefit increases as he says, I don't want you just to be forgiven and accepted as righteous. I want you to be my children. And you may remember the illustration we considered a couple of weeks ago where the man comes into the courtroom, the facts are plain, he's a condemned criminal, and yet the judge acquits him, and he's invited back into the chambers, and the judge says, now I want to take you into my home, I want you to be my son, I want to provide for you, and so forth. So this is an ascending benefit, even from justification, as God takes undeserving sinners he not only forgives them, acquits them, accepts them as righteous, but now he says, I want you to be my dearly loved children. So those are things we need to keep in mind as we take up this subject of adoption. Well, let's take up our copies of the confession. And uh, we've only got one paragraph here. But as they say, this paragraph is jam-packed. So I think this is going to take all of our time this morning. But let's read this together as our confession of faith, a glorious statement of what God has done for us in Christ. Please read with me. For the sake of his only Son, Jesus Christ, God has been pleased to make all justified persons shares in the grace of adoption, by means of which they are numbered with and enjoy the liberties and privileges of children of God. Furthermore, God's name is put upon them. They receive the spirit of adoption, and they are enabled to come boldly to the throne of grace and to cry, Abba, Father. They are pitied, protected, provided for, and chastened by God as by a father. He never cast them off, but as they remain sealed to the day of redemption, they inherit the promises as heirs of everlasting salvation. So the foundation of adoption, several truths uh, underscored by the confession. First of all, the recipients of adoption, who is privileged to be known as the children of God. And so our confession rightly identifies the adopted ones as all those whom God has justified. Having given sinners one blessing in Christ, he proceeds to increase their blessedness through adoption. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. Here Paul is writing to churches in the area of the world where Ismail comes from. And he's seeking to remind them of the privileges that they have in the Lord Jesus Christ and to make sure that they're firmly rooted in the gospel. We'll look at Galatians several times because Paul deals with the subject of adoption several times in this letter. Let's read in chapter 3, verses 23 to 26. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Now Paul here is comparing the condition of the children of God under the Old Testament and under the New Testament. And he says that back under the Old Testament, you were, in a sense, imprisoned. You were children of God, but you were under guardians. But now that faith has come, faith in Christ has come, we are released from that guardianship. We have the full identity of being children of God. So um, 
Here is a text that reminds us that all who are justified are also now included in this blessing of adoption. So if God has forgiven you, you can be certain you are also his child. What's the source of this adoption? Well, the confession makes it plain, God has been pleased. This is the work of God to adopt the justified people as his dearly loved children. In the original 1689, this language is used, not something that we use today, God vouchsafe. And what does that mean? Well, he could descend, he condescended to grant a wonderful favor. Let's turn over to 1 John chapter 3. Here the Apostle John wants to impress upon our minds the incredible blessing that is ours because of this gift of adoption. 1 John 3, familiar words beginning with verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. And so the Apostle John wants to impress upon our minds this fact that God has poured out his love upon us, that we are in an incredibly favored position. And then also in terms of its foundation, not only the who, the recipients, all the justified, and the source coming from God himself, but the ground of this work, how can it be that God can take guilty sinners and make them his children? And as with justification, the reason for God's adoption of sinners is the work of Jesus Christ. Let's turn back to Ephesians chapter 1. Here Paul is in a glorious way outlining God's saving purposes towards us. And in verse 5 he says, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And so this was God's plan back in eternity when he marked us out, he predestinated us not merely to be forgiven, but even beyond forgiveness, that we should be adopted as his sons. And how? Through Jesus Christ. Because of that work that Christ has done in his life, in his suffering, in his death, on that grounds, God not only forgives us, he receives us as his dearly loved children. So that's the foundation of adoption. And then secondly, the blessings of adoption. And these blessings uh, take up the rest of chapter 12. And here um, the confession proceeds to list 14 blessings that God confers upon his children. So as we think about, we are now children of God, we have been adopted into his family. What are all of the blessings that we have because of this glorious work of adoption? And so, 14 blessings, and they're in front of us this morning in four groups. So, in terms of these blessings, we're children of God, the first group is we have been incorporated into God's family. Here are the first four blessings. We're numbered with the children of God. Turn in the Gospel of John to chapter 1. 
We're going to look up a bunch of verses as we think about these blessings. John 1, the Apostle John is introducing us to the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking of how he was rejected by many people. John 1 and verse 9, the true light which lightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So here the Apostle John wants to teach us about the Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship with him and the blessings that have come to us because of our relationship with him. Having believed on Jesus Christ, he's given us this right, this privilege. It belongs to us the right of being the children of God. And then he goes back and gives a further explanation for our birth as God's children. And these terms, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, it has to deal with human relationships. And so John is saying essentially, you didn't become a child of God because your parents were Christians, they couldn't give you birth. You didn't become a child of God because a spouse was able to make you a Christian. You're a Christian because this is the will of God. That plan back in eternity when God chose you to be one of his children. And so now having believed upon the Lord Jesus, Christ himself has given us the authority to be named as children of God. Brethren, I don't know that this truth, this reality, really grips our hearts. That we can go out into the world and say, I'm a child of God. You know, we often identify ourselves by our human family, and sometimes we may be very proud of our parents and, or relatives, and we might say, you know, I belong to this family, and these were my parents or my aunts or uncles or whatever. But to be able to say, God is my Father. I am a child of God. That is a privilege far above any other privilege we could know in this world. So uh, here's a blessing of adoption numbered with the children of God. But also we enjoy the liberties of God's children. Let's turn back to the book of Galatians. That same context we were looking at before, as Paul is identifying the fact that as new covenant believers, we have been freed from those Old Testament uh, ceremonial commandments and rules. Galatians 4 and verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Now, here he's explaining things that seem so strange to us. That in the ancient world, particularly in the Roman Empire, um, a, a child who might have a very wealthy father, and so, ultimately, the heir of the entire state, when he was a child, he was just treated like a slave. He didn't have those privileges of sonship until he came of age. And so Paul is saying, we were like that under the Old Testament period. 
We have these guardians. We have the law over us. All of the ceremonial commandments. But then in the fullness of time, Christ has come. And he's taken those things away. And we have come to enjoy the inheritance, the liberties of God's children. Also, we're reminded that we enjoy the privileges, not only the liberties, but the privileges of God's children. Back to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, here the apostle outlines some of these privileges. Romans 8 and verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So, what are some of the privileges of God's children? Well, to have the Holy Spirit and to be led by the Holy Spirit every day of our lives and to have the confidence whereby we can pray and cry out to God, Abba Father, He's our dear Father in heaven and we have this privilege of being able to speak to Him. And then also this incredible privilege that the Spirit of God helps us to be convinced that we are God's children. How often do we have struggles with assurance that we may doubt, but the Spirit of God bears witness with us that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. As Paul says in writing to the Corinthians, we are the sons of God, Everything belongs to us. So you think about the world, you think about the universe, every inch of it belongs to God. Well, if we are the heirs of God, every inch of it belongs to us. Now that doesn't mean you can go out and stake your claim on your neighbor's property. Those privileges, many of them are going to be in the future. But everything belongs to us because it belongs to God. The privileges of God's children. And then also this blessing that God's name is put upon them. Over to Revelation, the last book in the New Testament, chapter 3. And here is Christ writing to the churches and encouraging them to steadfastness even in the midst of great troubles. Revelation 3 and verse 12 to the church in Philadelphia. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. So, we can't see it, it's not written on our foreheads to be able to look at each other, but God has put his name on us. In other words, he's claimed us as himself. He's put on us the name of the new Jerusalem. In other words, indicating we are going to be with him for all eternity. So here are these first four blessings out, outlined uh, in the confession of incorporation into God's family. The second group, that we have been given the character of a son. So here we see that in this work of adoption, that legal work, that God begins to change us. This is part of the blessings of adoption. We're given the character of a son. So we receive the spirit of adoption. We just read about that in Romans 8 and in Galatians 4. So the Spirit of God comes and He indwells in us. This is the Spirit that convinces us, assures us that we are children of God. But then we also come with boldness to the throne of grace. Let's look up this text in Ephesians 3. We were just looking at Romans 8, 
Paul saying the Spirit coming into our lives, uh, encouraging us to cry upon God as our Father. So similar things here in Ephesians 3 and verse 8. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So here's our privilege as the people of God, as children of God that we can come to God, to the very throne of God, the throne of the universe, and we can have confidence, we can come with boldness to Him. And the seventh blessing, as we already considered from Romans 8, that we're enabled now to cry, Abba, Father. Sometimes I think we need to be careful about rushing through our prayers. You know, we quickly say Father or our Father or our Father in Heaven at the beginning of our prayers and then we launch into our praying. Sometimes we just need to stop and think of the incredible privilege that we have to call the eternal, almighty, sovereign God our Father. Maybe just stop there and think about that before we proceed with our praying. So we're given the character of a son. And what's the character of a son? He knows who his father is. And he has boldness to come and ask his father for things. I never had any other boy in the neighborhood when our kids were growing up come and ask me if they could drive my car. But my boys did. That's the character of a son. We're bold and courageous to go to our Father and ask for things because we know He's going to give us what's good for us. So this is part of the blessing of adoption. Third general uh, uh, grouping, the experience of God's fatherly care. He, he treats us, God in heaven treats us as a father. So not only have we been brought into his family, we have this glorious pri privilege of being able to approach him, but we also brought to think about how he deals with us now as his children. So uh, six uh, blessings here are outlined in the confession, that we are pitied by God. Turn back to Psalm 103. Again, very familiar words. Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. In the old King James, the language is as a father pities his children, and the writers of the confession are picking up on that kind of language. The idea is that God looks down upon us and he cares for us deeply. He cares for us in everything that happens to us. The word here literally is mercy or love or uh, compassion is brought out in the ESV. It speaks of the heart of God towards his children. And so, whatever trial we're going through, whatever difficulty we're experiencing in life, whatever sorrow has come into our hearts, whatever we're struggling with, we can look to our Father in heaven 
And no, he's not simply distantly remote and has no idea of what's going on in our life, but we can know that he sees us and his heart is going out towards us. Oh, brethren, I hope you know that as you go through life and you go through trials, there's nothing like a friend coming along who understands and maybe they put their arm around you, maybe they'll pray with you or weep with you. God does. God, I mean, our friends love us and care for us, but they can't change our lives. They can't promise to us, I can turn everything for good. That's what God does. God says to those who love me, everything is going to work out for your good. Because I love you and I care for you. I pity you. My heart is towards you. How easily we forget that. And yet, this is one of the great blessings of adoption. To be pitied by God. But also to be protected by God. Turn over to the next book of the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs 14 and verse 26. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. And you know how often the Old Testament scriptures use that picture language of having a refuge, a, a cave, or a fortress where we can flee and find safety. And here we're reminded that the children of God have that kind of confidence that the Lord will watch over us and protect us in times of trouble. Another blessing, because of God's fatherly care, we are provided for by our Father in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus' familiar words in the Sermon on the Mount. Should we worry about our lives? Should we be full of fretting and, and care for what is going to happen? Wonderful words from Jesus, Matthew 6 and verse 30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And so after giving his disciples a nature lesson about the birds and how they're cared for and the, the grass of the field, the, the wild flowers that you see sometimes growing at the side of the highway. And you see them sometimes and they're beautiful. And you think nobody's caring for them. Nobody's, you know, weeding them. No one's fertilizing them. And yet they're beautiful. I remember uh, in, in Aurelia where I would rollerblade along this bike path. And there was at a certain point in the summer wild thistles that would bloom and the purple flower on the top was just spectacular and the color was so vibrant sometimes i was moved just to stop and look at it that's the work of god and jesus says if god does that for a wild plant that nobody else really cares about how much more is he going to care for you you're his dearly loved children he knows what we need, and he's ready to add to our lives what we need. Another blessing, sometimes we don't count this as a blessing, but it is to be chastened by God as a father. Turn over to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. And verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. 
For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. When Kathy and I were raising our children and would come to those times where discipline was necessary, we would always try to emphasize to our kids how much we love them. And I'm sure that they were tempted to think, yeah, right, my behind doesn't feel like you love me. And we might be tempted to think that with God. When because of some sin, his hand comes heavy down upon us and we think, Lord, what's going on? But God is determined to separate us from our sins. He's determined that he's not going to let us walk in that pathway that would go away from Jesus Christ. But whatever means are necessary, he's going to pull us back. So for the moment, all discipline seems painful. But after glorious benefits. And so God continues to do this in the life of his children. Another privilege of adoption, and I'll just mention this briefly, you can look up the text, that we're never going to be cast off by God. There's never going to come a time in our lives as the children of God where God says, I don't want you to be my children anymore. He reminds us we're written on the palms of his hands. That can never be erased. As well, we are also sealed to the day of redemption. At the end of the passage in Ephesians 1, where Paul outlines all of the blessings of salvation included in that description, he says we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. In other words, God has put his mark on us, and that mark is going to keep us until we arrive safely in heaven. Well, there's one more area for us to consider. We'll uh, conclude that next week pretty easily, and then we'll consider with sanctification. But I encourage you to take this chapter and just to think about it. And think about, this is what I have as a child of God. Well, let's pray together. Our Father, thank you for glorious, glorious privileges. May we not take them for granted, but help us to think through them, to know that even here this morning, your heart is towards us, you care for us, you are ready to provide us every good thing. Oh, Heavenly Father, would you today open your hand of blessing and grant to all of your children what we need, Thank you that Christ has accomplished this for us. May we revel in that today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.